Tonight, the Prime Minister's younger brother in the hot seat. I must insist that there was no foreign interference. Alexandre Trudeau grilled on a controversial donation linked to China, while Justin Trudeau pressed on what he knew about the threat of intimidation from China. Either he didn't know and he's incompetent, or he did know and he's a dishonest. Which is it? What to make of Russia's claims that Ukraine tried to assassinate Putin? I would take anything coming out of the Kremlin with a very large shaker of salt. And as Charles prepares for his coronation, Jamaica prepares to leave the monarchy behind. Do you feel like this is kind of a moment of change, a turning point moment in Jamaica? Definitely. This is The National in London with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. We are just outside Buckingham Palace tonight near Canada Gate where both anticipation and security are building ahead of King Charles's coronation. So that is still three days away, but already tonight people are camping out, making sure they get a front row seat to history. And after a security scare right behind me at the palace last night, police are also much more visible on the streets of London. But we begin tonight back at home with two major stories playing out in Ottawa, both with direct ties to the Prime Minister and China. Justin Trudeau says he has instructed Canada's spy agency to inform the government of any threats made towards members of parliament. That move comes after a wave of criticism stemming from a report that a Conservative MP was targeted by China but wasn't made aware. All of that took place in the lead-up to the Prime Minister's brother testifying about a controversial donation to the Trudeau Foundation. Rafi Bujikanian now on the growing concern over foreign interference and foreign intimidation. Once again, a Trudeau grilled about meddling by China. This time it was the Prime Minister's brother. I must insist that there was no foreign interference, no possibility of interference, no intention or means of interference at or through the Trudeau Foundation. Unapologetic about his role in a $200,000 pledge by pro-Beijing businessmen to the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. Signing for a donation at a time Justin Trudeau had just won his first election campaign as Liberal leader. It was no surprise to me. It was an honour to have someone say I, they wanted to create scholarships. The money collected only in part in 2016 and reimbursed this year after the Globe and Mail reported China was allegedly trying to buy influence. Alexandre Trudeau insisted the issue was not influence but rather bad governance at the foundation. You did not question the urgency of providing the donation around major political events for your brother. No, because there was an urgency long before my brother was in politics. And another urgent matter, a veteran Conservative MP says he's left with questions about China after meeting with CSIS over allegations of threats to his family by a Chinese diplomat, also first reported in the Globe and Mail. I think the, the Prime Minister and the government ministers have to come clean about who knew what and when. Questions echoed by his party's leader. There are two options. Option one, either he didn't know and he's incompetent, or he did know and he's a dishonest. Which is it? We put confidence in our intelligence agencies to take the actions that are necessary. The Prime Minister says he's now asked CSIS to proactively brief MPs about threats to them or their families, but whether in question period or at committee, the opposition says it still doesn't have any answers. And the only solution now is a public inquiry in to foreign interference. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. All right, so let's bring in Chief Political Correspondent Rosie Barton. So, Rosie, what do you make of what we heard from the Prime Minister's brother? Well, Adrian, you can certainly understand why the opposition parties uh, wanted this. Anytime they can link the Prime Minister's name to China and its attempts to influence or interfere in this country, there is a huge political potential. The problem is that in many ways this part of the story about the Trudeau Foundation has become kind of secondary and it doesn't really help Canadians understand 
what the risks are of China's influence. The Conservatives tried really hard to get the Prime Minister's brother to expand on some of his views on China, which have been somewhat controversial in the past. He made it clear he was there trying to defend the foundation, suggesting the whole committee was a waste of time, and he still believes that the donors with the connections to the Chinese regime were, in his words, honorable. And what about that complaint concerning the Conservative MP? Yeah, listen, these reports, as you, as you heard from Rafi there, about Michael Chong's family overseas potentially at risk, those are serious. And the Conservatives now have someone inside their own caucus who they can point to as someone who is feeling the potential impact of inaction on this intelligence. The government is probably going to be awfully relieved, Adrian, when it gets those recommendations from David Johnston in about three weeks' time, because as time goes on, it's clear the government is struggling to manage this as an issue. All right, Rosie, thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Now to Russia and its serious new accusation against Ukraine. The Kremlin claims Ukraine tried and failed to assassinate Vladimir Putin with a drone. But as Breyer Stewart tells us, what really happened is far from clear. In daylight, people can be seen on top of the dome of the Kremlin Senate. It's part of what's supposed to be a heavily secured fortress that Russia has accused Ukraine of trying to attack overnight. His video hasn't been verified, but the Kremlin claims its military and defense systems brought down two drones. Russian officials are calling it a terrorist attack, an attempt to kill President Vladimir Putin, whom they say was staying at a residence outside the city. Ukraine's president, who's in Helsinki, denied his country is involved. We don't attack Putin or Moscow. Uh, we fight on, on our territory. U.S. officials say they haven't been able to verify Russia's claims, but have their doubts. I would take anything coming out of the Kremlin with a very large shaker of salt. But if there was a foiled attack on the Kremlin, it's brought the war even closer to the capital. Moscow has promised retaliation, and the country's former president said there are no options left except to physically eliminate Zelensky and his clique. What really became suspicious is, you know, how come the air defense system didn't catch uh, this object before? This Russia expert says the fact that Moscow publicized this apparent strike when it has concealed other attacks suggests this is political. I think what he needs is the domestic support, and this really would give him sort of the domestic agreement from the population to sort of hit, hit harder. So, yes, I think this is, is, could be a sort of a, an internal, there's an internal component to this. Even as Ukraine is about to launch its counteroffensive, Russia insists that it's going ahead with its annual Victory Day military parade, but with tighter security. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Police in Serbia say a 13-year-old boy shot and killed eight of his fellow students and a security guard at his school. Investigators say the boy planned the attack weeks in advance, had a kill list in his desk, Six other students and a teacher were also injured. The scene when you see the kids, seven years old, are crying, uh, the parents, the, the grandparents, uh, it was terrible. The suspect and his parents have been arrested. Police say the guns used belong to his father. There will be three days of national mourning there starting Friday. And the suspect in a deadly shooting at a medical facility in Atlanta is now in custody after several hours on the run. Technology played a huge role, but technology doesn't do any good without people. The 24-year-old suspect is a former member of the U.S. Coast Guard. One woman was killed and four others injured. All of them were in a waiting room. Investigators say the shooter was also there for an appointment. A court appearance today for an Ontario man accused of selling a substance online that he allegedly knew was being used in suicides. He's facing charges in connection with two deaths in Ontario. And as Thomas Dagla tells us, news of his arrest sparked reaction far from Canada. Gary Cooper's family describes him as brilliant, loved and missed since Gary took a toxic substance last year to end his life. And his brother says it came from Canada. He found this website, this forum, 
before he could get better. So he didn't get a chance to heal. He would still be here now. Lee Cooper says he was surprised and relieved when he heard police near Toronto had arrested Kenneth Law, the Mississauga man accused of selling sodium nitrite online to people at risk of suicide. The 57-year-old made a brief court appearance by video link, speaking only to confirm his date of birth. Law faces two counts of counseling or aiding suicide in Ontario as police look for more alleged victims worldwide. We're aware that uh, packages were shipped to uh, over 40 countries. The Times of London first reported last week Law spent two years selling poison to clients. Over the phone afterwards, he told us he denied all allegations. I don't know what's the scope of what I can say, and I hope you can understand why. Um, I mean, this has been a very um, distressing experience. Families of sodium nitrite victims are demanding the shutdown of a notorious suicide forum, where anonymous users discuss methods of suicide and have chatted about Law's companies. In recent days, users in several countries who said they'd ordered Law's products posted about receiving police wellness checks out of the blue. It's just a shame that things like this couldn't have happened sooner. A lot of lives could have been saved, but a lot more are still ready to be saved. Sodium nitrite has legitimate uses in food preparation, but when ingested in pure form, it's known to turn red blood chocolate brown. In patients who purchase these suicide kits, uh, you know, they're, they're really struggling, right? And they're, they're needing help. So, Thomas, how big might this investigation ultimately prove to be? Well, we know police have said their investigation involves 1,200 packages, but it's not clear when investigators believe Law first got involved in this business. We found that he sought a trademark for the company name Escape Mode 14 years ago, and now police across Ontario are telling people to be on the lookout for parcels with that name and others associated with Kenneth Law. All right, Thomas Dagler, thank you. Now, if you or anyone you know is in distress, help is available through Talk Suicide Canada. You can call 1-833-456-4566 or text 45645. And of course, if it's an emergency, call 911. Quebec's premier is promising help for people affected by severe floods in that province. This as the desperate search for two missing firefighters washed away earlier this week has come to a tragic end. Here's Marina von Stackelberg. For days, rescuers combed this area northeast of Quebec City, searching for two part-time firefighters. The pair were swept away, trying to help local residents trapped by rising waters. Their bodies now found, 23-year-old Christopher Lavoie and 55-year-old Régis Lavoie, in the Bay St. Paul area in the Goof River. I think they were in really good faith trying to help. They, of course, didn't think that it would go so fast. Quebec's premier visited the devastated area, where water swamped vehicles, roads and houses, forcing hundreds to leave. We'll have to see what can we do regarding the infrastructures. Uh, uh, some uh, uh, problems may be solved, some maybe not. Maybe we'll have to ask some people to, to move. One resident says he watched the water rise more than two meters. Just seeing what's going to be next and if uh, the province will help uh, homeowners and business owners with anything because we're in the floodplain. And this only happens every 100 years, but I guess the 100 years was yesterday. Opposition leaders in Quebec say more needs to be done to prepare. In my part of the world, this is the third flood in seven years. Uh, people are growing tired and, and very tired of, of this. Uh, they want to see proper investments that are made. And I thought the Premier shut the door pretty quickly uh, with regards to investments. For those municipalities who deserve support in order to be ready for situations like those, because there are going to be many of those situations in the near future. Several Quebec communities remain under states of emergency. Down the river toward Montreal, multiple towns remain cut off. While in Gatineau, the rising Ottawa River has turned some roads into waterways. Mayors from across Quebec are set to meet later this week. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. And heavy flooding is also causing some serious problems in BC's southern interior tonight. 
The mayor of Cache Creek, just west of Kamloops, says floodwaters are swamping parts of his community, which is now under a local state of emergency. Some roads look more like rivers. There are several flood warnings in effect across the whole area. Turning back now to preparations underway here for King Charles's coronation and here in London and back at home. We now have details of the Canadian delegation that will attend. Along with the Prime Minister and the Governor General, astronaut Jeremy Hansen will be coming here before he heads to the moon next year. He will be Canada's flag bearer. Indigenous and youth leaders are also attending and 45 Canadian Armed Forces members will march in a military parade. They will arrive in a city that's decked out and ready for a show. As Chris Brown shows us, London is dressing up and focusing on security as the coronation approaches. The top hats, tails and fashionable fascinators are all coming out as the momentum builds towards the crowning of a new king. Charles, along with Camilla, the queen consort, mingled with some of their well-groomed subjects and a few famous visitors, such as singer Lionel Richie at a garden party. It's nice to see everyone, irrelevant who or where they come from. Everyone gets together. It's a big one party, isn't it? But it's a party happening against an unprecedented security backdrop. Monday night, a man threw shotgun cartridges onto the grounds of Buckingham Palace in what police called a mental health issue not terrorism. Still, facial recognition cameras are being used and anti-monarchist groups have been told they must behave. We have an extremely low tolerance for anything or anyone who comes to disrupt this event. Tourism officials are expecting potentially two million extra visitors. Canadian bagpiper Nico Gravel from Ottawa got here early and is busking his way around coronation venues. You know, in my lifetime, how many times am I going to see a king uh, being crowned? Uh, you know, trying to brighten the mood and trying to, trying to do my part. Others are doing that through street art. Nathan Bowen told us he's not really a monarchist, but is still offering his own take on the new king and queen. He said it's part of our country, isn't it? We've got to deal with it. So, you know, why not make art out of it? Why not make it into something that's fun and exciting? Predictably, there are already early arrivers camping out at the best spots, and some got a sneak peek at the Royals arriving at Westminster Abbey for a rehearsal. While the coronation will be rich in tradition, this historian says its most important role will be making a statement about Britain's present and its future. Sustainability, cost of living, green issues, they're all at the agenda. Charles III very, very much pushing that. And the same with inclusivity, a wider, wider faiths being represented. So it's very much a 21st century coronation. And Chris, you mentioned the heightened security. It really is everywhere. It's striking when you walk around all the venues, just all of the British bobbies, some 30,000 hmm. uh, police officers on watch. And Canada's government is clearly concerned too. It has issued a travel advisory for the coronation, uh, Adrian, urging people to exercise caution because of the threat of terrorism. All right, Chris Brown, thank you. Princess Anne was out today meeting with military members taking part in the coronation. On the heels of our exclusive interview, you'll be able to see more of it, including what she had to say about her connections to Canada. There it is. That's the fall. Your injury or your fall in, in Montreal, do you, do you remember much of it? I no. Mean, you really don't? Well, I don't. I don't I barely remember starting. I certainly don't remember finishing, so... Our full interview airs Friday at 7.30 p.m. local time on CBC Television, 7.30 Eastern time on CBC Explore. A reminder, we are coming to you from London all week in the lead up to the coronation. I'll be hosting CBC News' special live coverage on Saturday starting at 4 a.m. Eastern. You can watch on CBC, CBC News Network, Explore and Gem. As London prepares for the big event, there is a growing number of Brits who wish it just wasn't happening at all. Are the calls to get rid of the monarchy getting louder? There's a magic family that has magic blood that gives them the right to hundreds of millions of pounds while people are starving. An ominous warning from a man at the forefront of artificial intelligence. If they're much smarter than us, they'll be very good at manipulating it. So what can be done to stop it? 
and the growing concern that India's press freedom is under threat. We have seen very open raids of media houses. We are back in two. A renowned Canadian-British computer scientist known as a pioneer of artificial intelligence has quit his job at Google to warn against the very technology he helped create. Nisha Patel explains why. From smart speakers to self-driving cars, artificial intelligence has worked its way into modern life. Jeffrey Hinton is known as the godfather of AI. His groundbreaking work at the University of Toronto paved the way for much of that technology. Now he warns it's progressing so quickly it could soon outpace humans. I'm sounding the alarm and saying we have to worry about this. Hinton says he quit his job as a senior VP at Google this week so he could discuss the dangers of AI freely, including being used to spread misinformation. And while this might sound like a Hollywood movie, he says there's a chance AI could literally start thinking for itself. If they're much smarter than us, they'll be very good at manipulating us. You won't realize what's going on. Concern about artificial intelligence has surged since last year's launch of ChatGPT, an advanced chatbot that communicates with humans and can even mimic their speech. Since then, a chorus of tech titans have called for a six-month pause on advanced AI experiments. Take steps maybe to um, uh, keep it from being too horrible and bad. This expert says AI has improved almost every industry, from medicine to manufacturing. But there are risks. The genie's out of the bottle, and stopping it is not an option. And so how do we guide it, and how do we... How do we prepare our institutions? Crucial questions ringing out from Silicon Valley to Washington. Tech companies have a responsibility, in my view, to make sure their products are safe before making them public. But critics say governments will need to hold companies accountable. These companies spend hundreds of millions of dollars on lobbying. They work hard to shape regulation to ensure that it benefits them and doesn't stand in the way of those two imperatives, profit and growth. So as artificial intelligence races ahead, the world needs to catch up. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. Artificial intelligence is just one of the growing threats facing journalism, according to Reporters Without Borders. The nonprofit released its annual index of press freedom around the world. A record 31 countries are listed as in a very serious situation. One of those countries is India, which fell significantly. Salima Shivji shows us why. The crush of reporters, a common sight in India, long known for a boisterous press. But this scene belies what's laid out in the latest World Press Freedom Index. India slipping 11 spots to 161st out of 180 countries. Ravish Kumar knows it all too well. The longtime familiar face of one of India's largest TV networks now runs his own YouTube channel. You won't see me on NDTV anymore, the anchor announced late last year. I've resigned. It came after a hostile takeover of his news channel by Gautam Adani, one of India's wealthiest businessmen with close ties to the Modi government. How can any journalist work in that situation? I could not stomach it, he says. To me, Adani is an extension of the state. The media in India is finished, Kumar says. It's at a dead end. On air, all you hear is support for the prime minister's politics. The latest index points to that tightening of corporate control and what the NGO calls an explosion of arrests and detentions of journalists as factors in India's low ranking. The country now behind Nicaragua and Afghanistan when it comes to press freedom. The Indian government has dismissed the index in the past, calling the methodology questionable. They've regressed. But among India's journalists, there's apprehension. We are seeing very open raids of media houses, uh, which are seen as independent and dissenting voices. We are seeing uh, charges against journalists. Even the BBC was not immune to raids from Indian tax authorities, mere weeks after the British broadcaster aired a documentary critical of India's Prime Minister. I see a very bleak future, really. And she thinks it will only get worse for journalists, with India's general election slated for next May. 
Salima Shivji, CBC News, Mumbai. As King Charles gets ready to take the crown, one country gets ready to drop it. We should move past the monarchy and become autonomous. Jamaica seeks to move on from the royals, but for some, it is not enough. I don't think um, just removing them can take away the years of slavery and the mental slavery from colonialism that came after. And those sentiments are also being echoed right here in the UK. The monarchy survives by public consent. That consent has to be informed. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. barricades, the banners, all the police. It is very clear that London is just days away from hosting a huge event, the coronation of King Charles III. There is a slightly festive air in the city, but that festivity isn't shared by everyone. Anti-monarchists are planning to protest, and some say they're getting letters from the British Home Office warning them about new laws now in effect. Those laws are designed to stop interruptions like blocked roads or airports. Police will also have the power to search protesters. The new law is a window into the sometimes tense mood here. And it raises a question, just how much is this country's attitude towards the monarchy shifting? In the royal bubble, when the view is perfectly choreographed, the king's welcome appears so very supportive. But widen out the perspective a bit, and it all looks different. Right across the street from the royal fans in Liverpool are the anti-monarchists. A collection of Republicans who follow the king, often around the country, just to be seen and heard. Sometimes it means getting into it with those ready to defend the monarchy. Because that pays for the staff. Is they don't the, pay their no, staff. No, the royal pledge. We pay the staff. Is that, is it, I've actually had a few friends who, they are pro-monarchy, and I've managed to convince them otherwise. I think it's ridiculous that in a country that's supposed to be a democracy, there's a magic family that has magic blood that gives them the right to hundreds of millions of pounds while people are starving. Children are starving! Why pay for him? Why pay for him? The money conversation is especially loud now in the lead up to the apparently pared down but still ornate coronation. The wealth especially relevant now. The thing is there's also enormous private wealth that just passed from monarch to monarch, free from inheritance tax and largely free from real scrutiny. And if you just look there, you can see very clearly, net assets, 653 million, you know, no dispute. Enter the Guardian newspaper. Investigations correspondent David Pegg, part of a team that spent months hunting for precise details about the royal wealth, public and private, and where it all comes from. The whole series is a drip, drip of details, dropping, of course, in the days before Charles is crowned. This is a ruby that was taken from from India by the East India Company. It's still in the possession of the British crown now. And India wants it back. Looted treasures, masterpieces held in royal palaces away from public view, and a legacy of riches built from the monarchy's connections to slavery and colonization. The lack of transparency on all of it adding to public aggravation, particularly in a moment when the economy is rough, interest rates are high, and so many are living on the edge. You have things like Sandringham. Uh, and Balmoral. These are private country estates. They're owned by him. There's no doubt about it. He could sell them tomorrow. At the other end of the spectrum, you have stuff like Buckingham Palace. Mm -hmm. He can't sell that. But then you have all sorts of weird assets in the middle, and it can make it very, very difficult to tell what is public and what is private. And the monarchy survives by public consent. That consent has to be informed, and it has to be kind of, you know, earned. And so simply saying, we're not going to talk about it, you know, that's not going to fly. I don't think you can really get away with that in the 21st century. All London is a blaze of colour in a light, rather feminine scheme befitting a young queen. It's easy to look back at the 1953 coronation and marvel at how different the world seemed. This is from Canada's National Film Board. Look at all that scaffolding being built in the days leading up to the Queen's coronation. All of it created so people could crowd around to watch every step of the coronation 
of a 25-year-old, a mother of two, just a bit younger than the average age in the UK at the time. And this is today. And the mood about getting ready to watch such a familiar face being crowned seems so relatively muted. I don't want to get rid of them, but I don't care about them. I have no issue with the monarchy personally, to be honest. I'm very happy for them to be in what power they have. But again, like popularity-wise among young people, it's very much gone down. Yeah. That's accurate. A YouGov's poll in the UK released today says only 36% of 18 to 24-year-olds want to keep the royal family in place. That's a big drop from 2013 when 72% wanted to keep it. Anti-monarchists leap on that for fundraising and recruiting for a movement to abolish the monarchy. But Robert Hardman, author of Queen of Our Times, doesn't see an end in these times. Very happy or just not bothered either way? I think if the thing were to be under threat, then I think they would get very perturbed. I think it's one of those things people just accept. It's like, you know, it's like the rain. It's like, you know, red post boxes. It's a sort of part of British life. But it's when you, when you say you're going to take that away, when that, that part of just the national fabric is under threat, that's when people respond. And I don't think there's any sense that it is under threat. So even though the, the anti-monarchy, pro-republic voices are a little bit louder now, it sounds like you see them as just a bit of a speed bump. I see them as, as something that's always been there, actually. I mean, at the time of the Queen's coronation in 53, you look at the sort of newsreel, it looks as though the entire country is sort of in, in, in some sort of trance-like state of joy. Actually, even then, 20% of people said it was time to get rid of the monarchy. So it hasn't really shifted much. The stats back that up. Over the span of 30 years, Ipsos asked if people in the UK would prefer to become a republic or stay a monarchy. Look at that line. 18% favoring a republic in 1993, 22% last year. Some polls put it slightly higher after the death of the Queen, but not that much higher. It's never going to be the, the mob that, that gets rid of the monarchy. It's never going to be a revolution. It's going to be, you know, the, the risk is one day people turn around and go, oh, we've forgotten why we've got this thing. Why is it here? You know, that's, that's the danger. On this point, the anti-monarchist pro-republic movement entirely agree with him. And then at some point there will be a clear argument for a referendum when, when those uh, numbers between republicans and monarchists are much uh, closer together in the polls. <laughs> Graham Smith is leading the charge, as he has been for years, has plans for more. And we'll probably start doing it where William turns up as well. And we'll continue to use the growth and resources to, to, to grow the campaign and to really engage with people. This is a turning point for the campaign. The protesters are ready, and so are the police. But it's what happens after the coronation that will really matter. Still, though, keep an eye on the crowds. On Saturday, the coronation is the biggest ceremonial occasion held in London in 70 years. The 11,000 extra police officers on duty are absolutely bracing for protesters who may try to disrupt the processions. Those police have been quick to arrest in the past for heckling Prince Andrew, for holding up signs saying abolish the monarchy. They will likely be very quick to arrest this time. The anti-monarchist sentiments are also reverberating across parts of the Commonwealth. That makes me look on the head of state and I'm asking, like, what is the purpose? Jamaica's relationship with the royals nears its end. Next. Coin collectors can now add these to their collection, these special Canadian design coronation medallions approved by King Charles himself. They come in both silver and bronze. One features Charles and Camilla, the other is Charles alone with the royal cipher. And on the reverse, six maple leafs, one for every coronation since Confederation. Now, many Canadians are ready to mark the reign of a new monarch, but for many others in former British colonies, this is an opportunity to reflect on their relationship with the monarchy. Ellen Morrow recently traveled to Jamaica, where they are already planning to remove Charles as head of state. 
At this bar in Kingston, no one really cares about King Charles's coronation. He's the king of Jamaica too, but to a lot of people here, that makes no sense. If I need to go to the UK right now, I need a visa. Things like that makes me look on the head of state and I'm asking, like, what is the purpose? I think it's time for us to address it as a nation. We should move past the monarchy and become autonomous. <laughs> Jamaica is set to be the first domino of Charles's reign to fall, the country planning to ditch the monarchy, a reckoning for centuries of slavery under British rule. At Immaculate Conception, an all-girls high school in Kingston. Are you guys going to watch the coronation? No. No, 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 no. I didn't even know that was happening. These students want a head of state who looks like them. Princes, princess, kings are from fairy tales and fairy tales are like old, 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 really old. And we're in the modern day where I can be on my laptop, my phone, etc. Why am I seeing a king? Summer Lee, Tony Ann, Jade, and Dana are all old enough to vote in the referendum the government is planning on removing Charles as head of state by 2025. We'd like to have our own Caribbean identity, and I feel like the presence of a monarchy really impedes that. It's like hanging over Jamaica, that kind of thing, like holding us back and keeping us from further progress. Do you feel like this is kind of a moment of change, a turning point moment in Jamaica? Definitely. I mean, from what we've been discussing, it kind of just frees us, frees us from the Eurocentric um, hole that is on us. It mm -hmm. is a turning point, but it's there's more to be done. Yeah, there's definitely more to be done because I don't think um, just removing them can take away the years of slavery and the mental slavery from colonialism that came after. The royal family was tied to the slave trade from the very beginning. The Royal African Company that forced people here operated under a royal charter from King Charles II. And many of the people brought here were branded, literally burned with the letters DY for the then Duke of York, who ran the company. So the royal family and many persons in the British government um, both past and present have been deeply involved in gaining wealth from the atrocity which happened on these beaches. Dave Goss, director of the Institute for Caribbean Studies at the University of the West Indies, is angry that there's never been a reckoning for any of it. There, there, there was a time when like, my grandparents sang, rule Britannica, rule the wave. <laughs> Today we no longer sing that. Even when emancipation finally came, the enslaved got nothing. Instead, 20 million pounds, nearly $30 billion today, was paid out to slave owners by the British government for their loss of human property. What we really want is for someone to have the balls to apologize and say, we are sorry. Instead of an apology, all Jamaica got was this. I want to express my profound sorrow. Slavery was abhorrent, and it should never have happened. Last year's tour was meant to be a charm offensive, but with a colonial-tinged military parade and this disastrous photo op, it only spurred Jamaica's plans to move away. What does it say to you that there just hasn't been an apology? An apology alone is not enough. Some kind of uh, reparation is needed, whether in terms of health care, education. So a program is needed to right that wrong, because that wrong is still out there. A wrong that still permeates all aspects of Jamaican life, say scholars, tracing Jamaica's deeply entrenched poverty, stark class divides, lack of development, all back to slavery, to the suffering it inflicted, to the wealth it stole. That reality is fueling the government's fight for reparations. Jamaican lawmakers say the country is owed more than $10 billion. We want to right that wrong. Culture Minister Olivia Grange says the country will petition King Charles directly. It's more than getting a commitment from them. We're not asking for a commitment. Neither are we asking for handouts. We're asking that 
the wrong that was done, that they should repair that damage. We're not going to stop until we get justice. Do you feel like it will ever come? It will take a time because it's a process, but it will come. This is Kingston's sprawling coronation market. The site once a burial ground for enslaved people. Here, anger over the royals. King Charles, eh, Adam and the slave, he is slave master. The head of the slave master. So we're not associated with him. Mixes with anxiety over the future. King Charles, yeah, he's OK with me. Jamaica and all don't know what they're doing. They need some type of support system. Groups, to ax the monarchy, Jamaica will need to rewrite its constitution. Advocates like Opal Palmer Adisa and Robert Stevens say it's a chance to create a better country. One of the weakest link in Jamaica now is that the average person doesn't feel empowered. They're part of a group trying to empower people in the process, working to make sure as many voices as possible are heard. How do we get the masses of people involved? How do we get that education so that they're properly informed and they can have input? Some might look at Jamaica and think, well, whoever the head of state is is a side issue versus these everyday challenges people face. What would you say to them? Things like the level of crime in the country is a concern. OK, how do we begin to address that? by looking at things in the Constitution that we can tweak. It's not just a simple thing of saying, let's ditch the king and the, or the queen and let us move away from the monarchy. For Jamar Clark and Kimberly Williams, Jamaica's move away is way overdue. Now they just hope the UK and the royals do something to atone. Even if it's not monetary, there are many other ways we could explore working together as a nation to make Jamaica economically buoyant, you know, because I don't think it's beyond us as a people to be a first world country. That hope for the future as Jamaica gets ready to break with its past. So Ellen, I'm curious, you spoke there about a referendum. So is Jamaica cutting ties a done deal or is there still some chance it won't happen? Well, the culture minister, Adrian, made a point of talking to us about just how proud of a country Jamaica is. And think about its huge global cultural impact. Reggae, Rastafari, Usain Bolt, Bob Marley. So it's just become completely nonsensical to so many people on the island that it has this faraway king with so little in common with anyone or anything in Jamaica and to who so many represents this legacy of brutal oppression. Now, we did speak to some Jamaicans who told us that they like the royals and they don't want to cut ties. But opinion polling shows that a growing majority of Jamaicans do. And so do both of the main political parties in Jamaica. So it really does feel like Charles's, the royals' time is running out on the island. And when that happens, Jamaica would follow by Barbados, which cut ties with the monarchy in 2021, and several other Caribbean countries, Adrian, are having this exact same conversation. All right, Ellen Morrow, thank you. You're welcome. Next, the Royals superfans camping out for days for a chance at a glimpse of the king. Three cheers for the king and queen. Hip, hip, hooray, hip, hip, hooray. God save the king. The anticipation is building in our moment. We showed you earlier just some of the people camping out for days already, enduring London's cold, hard cement just to get a prime spot for the coronation procession. Well, there is no doubt some are questioning the future of the monarchy, but for these diehard fans, admiration for the king endures. Their unbridled excitement is our moment. Hip, hip, away! Hip, hip, away! Free cheers for the king and queen! I think we've been told we're the first ones here. What we're, we're doing it for king and country. And we, we can't wait for the coronation. You can't explain it, the excitement that's in the air. There's nothing like it. I came last night, and he was here early in the morning. But we were, we were able to sleep on the grass. 
It's such a momentous occasion. This is what we do. We're British, and so I'm here. <laughs> so hopefully it'll be warm and dry tonight. So I just, and they're, tonight they're supposed to do a rehearsal. A dress rehearsal. Electric, festive, because we've never seen this before. For 70 years, we haven't had such a show of Britishness. I'm just happy to be here and be part of history. Three cheers for the king and queen. Hip, hip, hooray, hip, hip, hooray. God save the king. I feel like there are some familiar faces in those crowds. Sometimes we see uh, these folks. Uh, we saw them at the Jubilee, also at the funeral. That excitement is, is still in the process of building. It's not entirely here yet in the city, but they've got a bit of time. And we will be back here in London tomorrow as we get closer to the marquee event all of these super fans are waiting for, the coronation of King Charles III. That is the national for May the 3rd. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.